Are you all ready to get into the scriptures? If you have your Bibles, where am I going to ask you to turn? This is a quiz. Colossians, yes. <laughs> I sent you an email. I don't know if you received it. If you didn't, we don't have your email address. Make sure you get that to us. But I sent you an email about the verse we're going to look at today. And I, in that email, I, I also sent uh, some questions that we could ask ourselves. I actually also posted this on my Facebook page, uh, which friend us. Bonnie and I will friend you back or whatever that is, accept it or however that works. We will not reject you. How about that? And, uh, and I posted it on there, the questions kind of leading, kind of preparing us for today. Where the series that we're in is entitled Real Love. In the context of that series, we're really talking about relationships. And we're looking at relationships from Colossians chapter 3. So within that chapter, we're, we're looking at some of these different aspects of our relationships. We're going to talk about parenting relationships. We're going to talk about marriage relationships. We're talking about relationships in general. Today, we're going to talk about some of the articles of the garments that we're to put on as Christians. Because Paul the Apostle says you need to take this, these clothes and you need to put them off. And that's anger and, 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 and impatience and all of that and judgment. We put those off. Then he says you need to put these on. And he talks about the, the garments that we need to put on. Uh, the, the, the clothes, that we need to dress ourselves a certain way. So today, we're going to look at some of those individual pieces of garments, all right? And so it says in verse 12, Colossians 3, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on, put on, here's the clothe ourselves, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. So what we're going to do today, it's pretty simple. We're going to look at each one of those articles of garments, those clothes. Uh, we're going to look at each one of those characteristics. After we're done looking at this, the worship team's going to come back. Uh, we're going to close out with a final song of worship. And uh, during that time, the communion tables are open. You can go to the God's table, go to the Lord's table and worship at his table together as a family or just between you and the Lord. You can come and kneel here and respond in that way. Some folks are being baptized, and so they're, they're strengthening their commitment with the Lord through baptism. And so that's our time to respond to the Lord. It's a beautiful thing. So, but before that, we're going to look at each one of these and kind of break these down, unpack these a little bit. Paul says these are the garments. We got to dress ourselves in the wardrobe that's becoming, that's correct for us as Christians, particularly in the area of our relationships. So here's the three things that we see with tender mercies. We're going to define each of these. Tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. We're going to define those. But here's what, we, here's what we discover with those. We see, first of all, these are the three points. Real love is willing to reach out. Number two, Real love is willing to, uh, real love is, real, uh, blah, I can't talk. That's really a tongue twister. Real love is willing to reach down. And real love is willing to keep going. So those are the three things that we see in those four characteristics. Tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Let's take a look at the word tender mercies. Therefore, beloved, put on tender mercies. I shared this story Wednesday night. It didn't go over that well. I'm hoping it goes over good this time. If not, I'm not going to use it. Tender mercies, 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 mercy. We need mercy. Just not just mercy, tender mercy. But this guy was wanted to have his picture taken, and so was, you know, he had this photographer and take his picture. And the guy took his picture. He looked at the picture and he says, "I don't like this picture. This picture doesn't do me justice." The guy looked at him and said, "Sir, with a face like that, you don't need justice. You need mercy." So. All right, I know that's not that good. So I, I want to try it again. I, 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 it, that's about how it went over Wednesday night. The idea is, is not just, so Paul says we need to put on mercy, but not just any type of mercy. He uses the word tender mercy. Now, now here's something that in, in, in another translation, actually the King James Version of the Bible, it says this, it, it doesn't use the word tender mercy it uses the phrase bowels of mercy. And that sounds a little bit more kind of gross or, or really intense, right? Bowels of mercy. But that's literally, that word for tender mercies is really translated, the Greek word really is translated bowels. It's actually referring to, the Greek word actually refers to the bowels of someone. And here's why. Because they believed 
that the, that the place where the deepest, most visceral emotions were in a person's life were contained within their bowels. Now, they weren't trying to be weird about that. But, but the, the analogy is, is, for example, and again, just bear with me, but when we, all right, just bear with me on this. I don't know if this is a good illustration, but I'll, I'll try it on you guys. You're the beta project. <laughs> when our bowels move, when there's activity, we feel that, right? And I'm not trying to be weird. We feel that deeply, don't we? And there's a reason for it. it. It has to happen. If it's not happening, people can actually die because the toxins in the, of, of, that's contained within the waste is still within the body. And so when that's happening, uh, our, when our bowels are moving, our intestines are involved, they're working correctly, it's pushing waste out through our system and out of our body. How many of you realize we need that? Honestly, we need that to happen. So when Paul says, uses the word bowels of mercy or tender mercies, it's the same Greek word actually, he's basically saying that we also should have deep feelings that actually result in something, that actually move us to action. See, the word compassion is different than the word pity. You can pity somebody and still be uninvolved and not moved to action. The word compassion or tender mercies, that phrase, is different than the word sympathy. You can feel sympathy or be sympathetic towards someone or their situation, but still be removed from it and not really do anything about it. Paul is saying that here's the garment I want you to put on. I want you to put on the kind of mercy that moves you to do something to help alleviate the pain of someone else. So the Bible says when others weep, we weep. And when they rejoice, we rejoice. Paul's saying that these tender mercies that we're to wear as Christians are the type of, it's the type of compassion that, that, that doesn't allow us to stand by and not, if we can, by the way, uh, to stand by and not do something to alleviate someone else's pain. To be connected, to be involved, to be, to, to be there for someone, to, to stop and help change the tire, to take a few moments and put your arm around someone who's weeping and weep with them and pray with them. These are, these are tender mercies. It's not just going through life, kind of shielding ourselves from the pains, pain of others. It's allowing ourselves to feel or be touched by the pain of of others, and then if we can do something, do what we can to help alleviate that. Does that make sense, everybody? It's tender mercies. It, it makes a difference in people's lives. It's, it's, it's meant to make a difference in people's lives. So we, 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 could ask, we could ask ourselves right now, is there someone that we know? Is there someone that we know right now? Can you think of someone who needs a touch of God's compassion? Do you know of anybody? If we do, let's call them. Let's text them. Let's go to coffee with them. Let's put our arm around them. Let's encourage them. Are you with me, everybody? Let's make sure they realize they're not alone. Let's let them feel, like, let's let them feel what God's compassion and real love feels like. It's tender mercies. Tender mercies. Real love reaches out. When the Bible says that Jesus was moved with compassion when he touched the leper, it's using the same word. And it's, it's talking about from his bowels. Literally, that's what the Greek word is talking about. It says that Jesus saw the leper and there wasn't any way that he was going to not touch him and heal him. He would do whatever he had to. Nobody was stopping him. Nobody was in his way. Nobody tried to, re, taught, tried to hold him back. Uh, the religious leaders, their attitudes are trying to keep Jesus from touching the leper. But the idea is, is that he, real love reaches out. He saw the leper. The leper approached him. The leper asked for his help. And really the idea is, is that if all the religious leaders tried to grab him and pin him down, Jesus would throw them all off violently if necessary just to make sure that he could touch that leper and heal him. Why? Because he was moved with compassion or tender mercies. Does that make sense, everybody? It's a garment that we put on. Real love reaches out. Here's, a, here's the other thing that we see is that real love reaches down. So look at this idea of kindness. Kindness and humility. Kindness 
and humility. So we put on tender mercies, but we're also supposed to wear this, this garment of kindness. Now that word kindness literally means to be adaptable. To be adaptable. Every now and then I'll see something on Facebook where somebody will say, this is who I am and this is what I'm all about and if you don't like it, you can just defriend me and blah, blah, blah. That is not kindness. That's silliness. That's junior high. That's, I don't care that you guys didn't invite me to the cool table. I didn't want to be there anyway. That's what that is. <laughs> but it's not the garment of kindness. A gal by the name of Helen, just little Helen, little, little Helen, senior citizen Helen, she would go to the post office. She loved the post office in her city, the, 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 the people there that worked there, the employees, the post, they were so friendly, and she went to get stamps. It was close to the Christmas time, so the line was extra long, and so one of the, one of the postal gals says, look, you, you don't have to, Helen, you don't have to stand in this long line. There's a, there's a stamp machine right over there, and she says, yeah, but the stamp machine won't ask me about my arthritis. She's looking for a little kindness. She's looking for a little connection, right? Does that make you see? And so kindness refers to this idea of being adaptable. So instead of saying, this is just the way that I am, if you don't like, can you imagine a marriage working like that? It doesn't. Honey, this is the way I am. You don't like it? Well, <laughs> that's going to be a bad day for the husband. That's not kindness. Kindness, everybody say the word adaptable. Yes. Kindness is adaptable. When we put on the garment of kindness in our relationships, we actually ask people questions. We, we treat it differently. We, we ask them, is there, can I do, is there anything I can do differently that would help this relationship? Is there any way that I can change to help you? See, nowadays we have this idea that we don't change at all. And if people really love us, they won't ask us to change. Let me just lay a little sunshine on all of us, including myself. We all need to change and we all need to keep changing because we're all carnal and we're all becoming more and more like Jesus. And hopefully we're more like Jesus next year than we are this year. But quite honestly, there are some things in all of us that need to change. Why? Because none of us are perfect. We're all in process. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We're all in process. And so you're not losing who you are by saying, look, is there, is there something I could do, Bonnie, to make this work? What can I do to make this easier? How could I enhance or enrich our relationship? Is there something that I'm doing that I need to stop doing? Or is there something that I'm not doing that I could do? You're not losing yourself. You're not giving yourself up. You're being a Christian. You're putting on the garment of kindness. Can I get a witness on that? Do you hear what I'm saying? See, nowadays, I'm telling you, our society is saying, man, you don't want to lose yourself. You just be you. All right, well, do you do you. You're going to end up doing you all by yourself. Or eight wives later, you're still doing you. Or seven husbands later, you're still doing you. But bless God, you're doing you. No. No. How many of you realize we have to adapt to each other? Come on. I, some of you are struggling with that. I know some of you are struggling with that. I'm going to let that just simmer. <laughs> Look it up. I got the notes on you version. That, that'll help you. I, I had the Greek word and everything. It's all right there. But here's the other, here's the other th garment. Not only kindness, but humility. So humility, humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking about yourself less. I stole that from someone and it sounded a lot more profound in my head. But humility is not thinking less of yourself. Oh, I'm nothing, I'm lousy, I'm miserable, I'm a loser. I'm... No, humility, being humble, is not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. It's being willing to put someone above you. Humility actually depicts someone who is, um, it's, it's someone who is, again, aware of others. But it also depicts someone who is modest they're not pretentious. Here's what humility. Humility describes someone who is willing to stoop down to help someone. There's not an elitist attitude. There's not a superiority attitude. It's, you're humble. There's a humility. We don't see ourselves less than others. Are you getting this? We don't, listen, we don't see ourselves as less than anybody. But we also don't see ourselves as better than anybody. Does that make sense, everybody? 
And so that means we're actually willing to stoop. We're actually willing to adjust ourselves. We're actually willing to reach down to help someone. Matter of fact, I, I, I heard this years ago. The only time we should ever look down on someone is when we're bending over to pick them up. You can, you can, you can tweet that. And number three, real love is willing to keep going. So let's look at the other garments we've looked at. Uh, the, the ones that we've looked at, tender mercies, kindness, humility. So let's look at the last two, meekness and long-suffering. Meekness. The word meekness describes someone who is patient. It, 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 it's not, a meekness is not weakness. So being meek doesn't mean you're weak. It isn't a weak person. Meekness is a controlled person. Actually, this Greek word oftentimes was used to describe a wild animal that had become tamed. That there is control, it's not, again, meek is not weak, it's controlled strength. Another use of this word is a medical term. In the medical sense, that word, that Greek word meek is used to denote a soothing medication that calms a person's heart and mind. So a meek person's response is so gentle and mild that it acts as a soothing medicine for someone who's angry or upset. It actually helps to de-escalate a situation because the Bible says in Proverbs that a soft answer turns away wrath. A soft answer turns away anger. Is that, are you hearing what I'm saying, everybody? And so when we put on this cloak of meekness, we're not being weak. We just realize that we're controlling ourselves. Where we could uh, become or be out of control in a situation, we're choosing to maintain control. And it does become soothing. The other word is long-suffering. That's the one I mentioned, I think, last Sunday. Uh, I really like this, this, I particularly like this Greek word. It's easy to pronounce. It's easy to remember. It's mac, uh, macrothumia, macrothumia. I jokingly said it's where we get our, our word, our English word macaroni, but that's not true. That's just what I think of when I think of the word macrothumia. I think of macaroni. I don't even like macaroni, but mac, macrothumia. So macro. It's a compound word. It's two Greek words put together. It's a compound word. The first part, mac, macro, uh, that definition of that is to be distant or, or far off. And, and thumos, which is the second part of that word, uh, has to do with anger or a strong emotion. And so when you combine the word together, you get the word long-suffering, which means that, well, it describes a candle with a very long wick. In other words, you're not easily angered. You're long-suffering. You're patient. See? And that comes with kindness, but you're patient. It's macrothumia. You, and it literally doesn't refer to God and us or us and God. It refers to each other. That we're willing to just stretch and let that go and give people time and space to respond, to correct, to respond to the Lord, to respond to prayer. We're just, you know, we're not going to act suddenly Macrothumia. Does this make sense, everybody? Here's what it says about love. We're talking about real love. Well, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says real love suffers long or is long suffering. One guy was camping, and, and he, he, there was another guy a little bit down there. He was camping as well, and he noticed he had trouble getting his fire started, campfire started, but his was burning pretty good. So he invited that guy over. He says, you know, I already got some food cooking here. Why don't you just come on over here, and, and you can eat dinner with me. And they were getting ready to eat dinner, and they were getting ready to pray. And he asked the guy, he says, don't you pray before you eat? And he says, no, I don't pray. The only, the only God I, uh, I recognize is the God of nature, and I don't recognize any other God. And this guy got, the other guy got real uh, insulted by that, threw him out of his tent, grabbed him by the shoulders, threw him out of his tent. He went from being kind to not being kind. <laughs> And the Lord spoke to the guy. He said, hey, where's your neighbor that you invited over? I said, well, he didn't, he, he didn't worship you. He's desiring you. I threw him out. And God says, no, wait a minute. You mean I've been long-suffering with that guy for 40 years and you 30 years, and you couldn't put up with him for a few hours? Long-suffering. Are you hearing what I'm saying, everybody? How many of you are thankful that God has been long-suffering with you and with me? 
and with all of us, right? And so Paul says, look, we, you know, we, we put on this, this garment of being long-suffering. We give people room. We give people opportunity. We give them time. We give them space. We allow God to work on their hearts as well as, as also as he's working on our hearts. But we're not quick to cut somebody off. We're long-suffering. That's what real love looks like. Amen. Now look, guys, we can't do that in our own strength. Because up to ourselves, we're not going to be kind. We're not going to be meek. We're not going to be humble. We're not. We're not going to be long-suffering. And we're not going to have tender mercies. We're going to drive right by the guy that's broken down. We're, especially if we don't like him. We're not going to do that on our, in our own. But because God's love is on the inside of us, and it's real love, if we'll receive it and we'll put this on, it'll change the way we behave regarding the people around us. Does that make sense, everybody? The world will get a chance to see the love of God. Now, here's why this... Now, just think about this. This is interesting. One of the things the IRS still does, and we hope they continue to do, is they allow you and I to deduct our charitable giving. So when you give to New Life Church or any 501c3, any charity, whether well, whatever it is, crisis pregnancy center, whatever it might be, to your local church, the IRS allows us to deduct the amount of money that we've given from our income so that we're taxed less. So basically, the IRS, if you think about it, they give credit to people based on what we've done to help others. And here's the thing. We owed God a debt that we couldn't pay. He paid our debt. Jesus paid it on the cross. The debt that we owed God was paid and therefore eliminated. We don't owe God anything in that sense. We couldn't pay it anyway. We didn't have it to pay it. Are you following what I'm saying? But that doesn't mean we still don't owe. Because we have received real love, because we've received the love of God, we still owe. Romans 13 says this, Owe nothing to anyone except your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. So we God, Jesus canceled our debt that we had before God. That debt's been canceled, but that doesn't mean we don't owe anything. Right? Does this make sense? We still owe. We still owe others the expression of God's love. We're still indebted to the rest of the world, ladies and gentlemen. We're indebted to show them how real God's love is is. That's our debt. That's our debt. Paul the Apostle says that he was a debtor to preach the gospel to the rest of the world. He still saw himself indebted. Why? Because I've been forgiven so much and given so much, I do still owe, not God in the terms of earning my salvation, I owe others the expression of what real love is looks like. How many, of you would, how many of you would agree with me that, if anything, the world needs to see that? We're the only ones that can show that. We're the only ones. The world can try to do it, but it, they can't. Why? Because it takes God's love. It takes real love. It takes unconditional love. It takes divine love. It takes the love of of our Heavenly Father. That's the only way that we can express it. The only way we can express His love is by having His love in our hearts. Well, He's poured it out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. See, the world has no capacity to show it. At best, they can be kind to a degree, but they can't ultimately show this unconditional love that always hopes, always perseveres, never fails, never becomes obsolete, never becomes outdated. This love that endures everything, hopes everything, strengthens everything, recovers everything, restores everything. That's only God's love. And we're the only ones that can show him, show the rest of the world that. Amen. Does that make sense, everybody? So as we stand together and as we close out with this final song of worship, Father, we just ask that, well, 
For those of us that need to experience the strength of your love, in a, and maybe in a more profound way, in a deeper way, maybe we've had trouble believing how much you love us because of what we've done, because of where we've been, maybe even because of what's been done to us. It's difficult for us to receive that love. Well, God, first of all, we just pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you can begin to work in our hearts, maybe even in this final song, during this final song, and, and help us to be able to open our hearts up to receive the fact that we are loved, period. There's no qualification. And Father, if there's anyone that we need to love, if there's anyone that we need to forgive, if there's anyone that we need to to reach out to, if there's anyone that we need to show your compassion to, just give us the strength and the grace to do that this week. And Lord, as we, as we sing this final song together, as we sing it to you, as we sing it to one another, may the love of God just flow so freely through our hearts, our lives, our marriages, our children, our situation. God, may your love prevail. Right now, in this moment, may your love conquer. Let's just respond to the Lord as we worship Him. You can go to the tables and worship Him at His table. You can come here. Let's celebrate also those being baptized. But let's just, let's just respond to the Lord now as we sing.